Good morning, everyone. My name is Lawrence Alexander, and I'm Chancellor of the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff and Chair of the Board for International Food and Agricultural Development, or BIFAD. I'm very happy to welcome you in person and online to today's meeting. We are glad you're here. We're also pleased to have many representatives from the Feed the Future Innovation Lab community joining us today. For those of you not familiar with BIFAT, we are a seven member presidentially appointed advisory committee to USAID established under the Foreign Assistance Act and we help to connect the agency to, US, to the U.S. university community to address development challenges in agriculture, nutrition, and food security. I'd like to invite the members of BIFAD to introduce themselves, beginning with Ratan Lal, next Henri Moore, next Kathy Spann, and we have Marie Boyd and Sawita Liverpool Tassi on Zoom if you can go in that order, beginning with Rattan. Thank you. On the Bifard board. Not on? Oh, thank you. Now I got a twice opportunity. I'm Rattan Lal, Professor of Soil Science at Ohio State. It's one of my greatest honor to serve on the BIFAD board, especially under the able leadership of Dr. Lawrence Alexander. And I will second that. It is yeah. an honor. Uh, my name is Henri Moore, and I am VP Head of Global Responsibility at Halion, which is a GSK consumer health company. And it's a pleasure to, to be here and see you all. Good morning, and I'm Kathy Spahn. I'm the CEO of Helen Keller International and also co-chair of the Nutrition CEO Council and very honored to be a member of BIFAD and excited to be on the in-person side of a hybrid event for a change. <laughs> Marie? Greetings. I am... Marie Boyd, I'm an Associate Professor of Law at the University of South Carolina School of Law, and I'm pleased to join the meeting this morning. Thank you. And Sawida? Um, good, uh, um, good morning. I'm Sawida liverpool Tassier. I'm an MSU Foundation Professor in the Department of Agricultural, Food, and Resource Economics at Michigan State University. Um, wish I could actually also have been on the other side and in person, but I'm happy to still have the opportunity to join um, remotely. Thank you. BIFAD member Pamela Anderson is Director General Emerita of the International Potato Center, regrets that she's not able to attend the meeting today. <clears throat> Last year, USAID Administrator Samantha Power charged BIFAD to advise the agency on how to more rapidly and powerfully integrate climate change adaptation and mitigation in USAID's agricultural and food systems programming. We responded by establishing an expert subcommittee led by Drs. Lini Wallingberg and Aaron Coughlin de Perez. We asked the subcommittee to guide a study to address the ambitious goals set forth in the USAID climate strategy and the US government's global food security strategy around the need for systemic change in agri-food systems. USAID asked the subcommittee to also consider USAID's potential role as a major global player in the operational and organizational factors that characterize the agency day to day. During an afternoon session today, subcommittee members will introduce the report and we'll hear feedback from a diverse group of invited respondents. It's an exciting lineup and I hope you'll join that session and share your own feedback either today or during the public comment period or in writing through September 18th. The objective of this morning's session is to explore opportunities 
for USAID's research agendas to contribute to shared goals in climate change adaptation and mitigation, food secu security, nutrition, and livelihoods. I am grateful to the speakers and panelists for helping us explicitly account for climate imp impacts while advancing food security, nutrition, and environmental goals in our research. That's our aim to strengthen the relationships among these research investments, we hope the discussion will inform the report's recommendations around research. As an entry point to our discussion, we will use the U.S. government's global food security research strategy, recently revised, to include a stronger emphasis on climate change. And we're excited to have the co-leads of that strategy from USAID and USDA with us today. I want to take a moment, though, to recognize and honor the individuals who lost their lives on September 11th, 2001. And there is acute suffering as well, ongoing loss of life throughout the world in places like Morocco, Ukraine, and the Horn of Africa, suffering that USAID in particular seeks to alleviate. It is fitting indeed that we spend this national day of service and remembrance, helping to resolve one of the world's most intractable and critical problems, climate change. I'd now like to invite USAID's Chief Climate Officer, Gillian Caldwell, to frame the day and the morning session. Let's welcome Gillian to the podium. Morning, everybody. Uh, just over a year ago, I had the honor of speaking to many of you when the BIFAD subcommittee was launched. And the committee's charge, as was just noted, is to advise USAID on how to transform both agriculture and food systems and these interconnected crises of climate change and food security. The work that BIFAD has done and will continue to do as it absorbs our comments today and through the uh, public comment period really has the potential to impact people's lives profoundly by enabling families and communities to feed themselves, by providing a foundation for land and water management, and by helping us limit greenhouse gas emissions from land to keep global temperatures within 1.5 degrees to avert the most catastrophic consequences of the climate crisis. I just returned from the Africa Climate Summit in Nairobi, and the challenges this subcommittee has been addressing could not have been more prominent. The Horn of Africa is facing its fifth straight season of drought with more than 8 million people in need of humanitarian assistance and more than 4 million livestock dead. And we know that climate change only aggravates already existing inequality, causing the most harm to those that did the least to cause it and who are most vulnerable to its impacts, especially women, youth, and migrants. The terms of reference for BIFAD's work are unambiguous. We must achieve transformational and systemic change in the agriculture and food system. The climate crisis really leaves us no choice. But what exactly do we need to do and do differently as a whole agency at USAID? As hard as we all work, what we are currently doing as individual offices and programs is simply insufficient. Should we shift resources from some areas to another? What is our holistic vision and what's the roadmap to get there? At a practical level, what specific steps does USA need to take? As I was coming back from Nairobi, I wondered about what advice we'd hear today and about the response all of us might have to BIFAD's recommendations, which we'll dig into this afternoon. This morning, we're devoting our attention to a particular aspect of USAID's work on agriculture and food systems, which is the research. Of course, we're already investing in research, and lots of it, but we need research to develop and refine interventions if we are to achieve the systemic change we require. 
And given the growing devastation we are confronting, it is clear that in five or 10 or 20 years from now, we will need knowledge and tools that are better than what we have today. To name just a few major research needs, how do we link landscape planning, transparent supply chains, and financing? Design farming systems that can better withstand heat waves and prolonged droughts? Support agricultural landscapes that deliver multiple services beyond production that support well-being? Harness novel protein sources like insects to drive economic development and improve nutrition? design and deliver the most effective and equitable technologies and governance to manage land and water sustainably, nourish healthy populations while reducing the number of ruminant livestock on the planet, and in the worst case, help communities relocate when their farmland and rangelands no longer support agricultural production or any other viable economic opportunities. USAID has a particularly large investment in research around questions such as these through its Feed the Future initiative, which you just heard about. We provide about $150 million annually to a wide array of research partners, including the Feed the Future Innovation Labs, CGIR partners, and other private and public sector organizations. As we hear from an impressive and diverse uh, group of speakers today, I invite you to ask yourselves, what would the best mix of research programs look like? What could we do with that 150 million that we aren't doing today? I'm asking you all here in the room and online to step out of your organization's particular mandate and focus on possibility. As George Santayana said, necessity is the mother of invention. So let's think about what we need to do rather than dwelling on the obstacles we'll face in doing so. We must all ask ourselves across USA, not just within our agriculture teams, are we prioritizing research needs and allocating our resources and efforts to answer the most important questions so we can drive transformation in agriculture and food systems and make a big dent in these interrelated crises of climate and food security? Today, I'd really ask you to be candid and courageous and to think creatively and not to assume or worry that your idea won't be well received. We need an open mind. We need all of us to get to the right solutions together. And as was mentioned, of course, we'd like you to focus on uh, making sure you give even more detailed feedback um, by the September 18th deadline. Finally, as we start our day, I just want to thank Administrator Power and Abstentia for challenging BIFAD to help USAID address this particular issue. And I want to uh, thank the BIFAD and the subcommittee for leading such a vibrant dialogue about the changes needed. And thank, of course, all of you for being here and for your dedication and perseverance on these issues. Let's uh, dig in and move the, the ball forward together. Thank you. Thank you, Gillian. Next, we'll hear from Rob, Ber Rob Bertram, Chief Scientist in USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, who will discuss opportunities for research to bridge the gap between agriculture, food security, and the environment. Rob, let's welcome him. Uh, thank you very much, Lawrence. I'm gonna, unfortunately, I was just gonna say how wonderful it is to be together and then I found out this morning that I've been exposed. I've tested, so I'm, but uh, we were just talking with Kathy and Henri saying that with COVID, it's better to receive than give. So um, <laughs> anyway, it's wonderful to see everyone in person, as I said. Uh, I wanna start with a huge thanks to the subcommittee. I know how hard they have worked, how long they have worked, uh, and also to BIFAD and the administrator for, for convening this. This is exactly the way we'd like to see BIFAD work, to draw the best minds together to, to provide input to the advice um, to the administrator. Um, and I know we had extraordinary support from Clara Cohen, uh, from uh, uh, the whole Tetra Tech team, and I know Noel Gerwick uh, did uh, an awful lot from our DDI, among our other DDI colleagues. I'm also honored that we have Undersecretary Jacobs Young with us today. 
And uh, the, as you may know, the Office of the Chief Scientist at USDA co-leads the creation of the uh, Global Food Security Research Strategy under the Global Food Security Act. Um, so agriculture research under the Global Food Security Act, first and foremost, most, must lead to the innovations, to innovations that reduce malnutrition and extreme poverty uh, in the areas where Feed the Future works. But it's clearer than ever, uh, and every day goes by, we are reminded, that this must be done in the context of climate change and that many challenges, it, and the many challenges it poses to food security objectives, not to mention those in environment, biodiversity, water, and many other critical development objectives. So our research needs to integrate climate change, both adaptation, and I know that's in the lead, and Vaughn, our climate expert who couldn't be here, I think, uh, always reminds me this, and I agree, of course, uh, but also mitigation. They so often go together. So let's not ignore the role that mitigation plays in adaptation, uh, in, 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 in driving those gains in adaptation, I should say. Um, I was talking with Andy Jarvis, who works with the Bezos Foundation now after leading climate research in the CGIR for many years, and he said he always thought there was a trade-off between adaptation and mitigation, and after years and years of effort, they never found it. I mean, they really are, they really are, in, in, so even though our funding flows look one way, uh, I think we want to think in that integrated way uh, 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 to, to really um, act, be aware of those gains in both areas. Um, so, but we always start with our North Star of extreme poverty and malnutrition reduction. So I wanna challenge all of us, as Gillian just did, to think about how we do that. And I know we're gonna hear from Dr. Fowler, the Special Envoy on Food Security from the State Department, who will talk about his vision for adapt adapted crops and soils, which is directly addressing some of these challenges. And I also hope that wherever possible, we can be specific, thinking about how to integrate climate cha change with poverty and malnutrition outcomes. Um, I, I also want us to be very transparent. So if the subcommittee feels it didn't get something or it doesn't have adequate information, please let us know because we, I think you have another month or so before wrapping things up and we want to be fully transparent uh, just as we hope others can be specific in, in, in what they suggest. So as we think about how to do better, I'd like to share one challenge to our FTF community and then one to the broader development community that's assembled here. Uh, and is embodied in our new uh, uh, Resilience, Environment, and Food Security Bureau, REFS, that's being stood up. So potential increases in research budgets are being discussed. I'm sure many of you are aware of this on the Hill. Um, and I have to say that as I think about, well, what could we do to really do what we've all been talking about here, what we want to do this morning? And I think we really could do more on tree crops. So I think of things like coffee and cocoa, which are huge smallholder crops that drive food security for millions of smallholder farm families. They're also extremely threatened by climate change. And they're in diverse environments that sequester a lot of carbon and provide environmental services and other, other uh, broader gains. So that's one thing, I, and I, I can think of our US universities, our innovation labs, the private sector, CGIR, and NARS all contributing uh, to those outcomes. And then more globally, colleagues, we know that agriculture is part of the problem, driving particularly land conversion. If we look even in, in a very poor country, it's rarer, but DRC, huge amount of emissions associated with land conversion in, in a very poor country. And yet, where we work on agriculture and feed the future is in those densely populated agrarian areas where hunger and malnutrition and extreme poverty are most concentrated, but not generally where those issues around emissions associated with land conversion are, are concentrated. So we have sort of a disconnect. And I guess my sense is that if agriculture is part of the problem, it has to be part of the solution. And so in a way, we need to think about you know, agriculture may be beyond just a food security driver, but also a global, global climate change environmental 
uh, uh, sustainability, biodiversity conservation, water, environmental services conservation driver as well. And so we need to think, I think, in a more integrated way beyond just our, our silos, and I think, I think Gillian's also ch challenging us to do that. So I'm, I'm ex really excited that we have this tremendous subcommittee. Thank you all. And I'm very, uh, very happy at the prospect of taking this work together forward as a community. Thanks very much. Thank you, Rob. Now I'd like to invite Dr. Shavanda Jacobs-Young, Undersecretary for Research, Education, and Economics, and Chief Scientist of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, to share her perspective on the importance of research to address climate change and USDA's experience working with other agencies and partners on integrating climate across agriculture, agricultural nutrition, and food systems research. Please join me in welcoming Shavanda. Well, good morning, everybody. And Rob, we can always count on you for excitement. Remember, remember my fist pumps earlier, guys. <laughs> I'm glad you made it back safely. Well, thank you for that kind uh, introduction and succinct introduction, <laughs> Chairman Alexandra. Um, members of the advisory board for the International Food and Agriculture Development, U.S. Special Envoy, my colleague for Global Security, Dr. Fowler, so great to see you this morning. USAID Chief Climate Officer, Gillian Caldwell, distinguished guest, it is a pleasure to join you today. The current global situation, which we've heard some about this morning, underscores the need to unite behind common principles and take action to end hunger and poverty. Face the challenges of climate change head on and build more sustainable, equitable, and resilient food systems. Innovation is the key to increasing sustainable agricultural productivity growth and profitability in agriculture while decreasing climate and environmental impacts. Now launched by USAID Administrator Power and USDA Secretary Tom Vilsack at the World Food Prize last year, the US Global Food Security Research Strategy outlines the critical role research plays in improving both agricultural productivity, profitability, and resilience of food systems and agriculture. So they need to be productive. We've done a great job of that research-wise in the US. We also need to be profitable, and they need to be resilient and sustainable. Now, developed through a whole-of-government approach, all of the federal agencies coming together and co-led by USDA and USAID, the research strategy enables affordable, nutritious diets for a well-nourished population and meets the challenge of climate change. And it does so while advancing diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. And because we can't do it alone, this research strategy leverages key partnerships with U.S. universities, U.S. and international private business and nonprofit sectors, international agricultural research centers, and national research and extension systems in target countries, including government, universities, civil society, private sectors, and partners. I think you get the clue. It takes all of us working together. And finally, the research strategy highlights the importance of global efforts, including the Agriculture Innovation Mission for Climate. Now, in 2021, together with the United Arab Emirates, we launched Aim for Climate. Now, with over 500 partners from around the world, including 52 countries, Aim for Climate is growing rapidly. Aim for Climate focuses on driving more rapid and transformative climate action in the agriculture sector. Empowering agriculture innovation to be part of the solution, as Rob mentioned this morning, to address the climate crisis. Build resilience to its impacts and create co-benefits of climate action. To achieve this goal, Aim for Climate participants will catalyze greater investment in and support for climate smart agriculture and food systems innovations to help raise global ambition. It's time to move beyond strategies and plans and into action. We encourage all to join AIM for Climate. There is a seat at the table for everyone. 
Working together, we will help us quickly achieve solutions at the intersection of food security and climate change. Earlier this year, just around the corner, I passed it this morning at the JW Marriott, the United States hosted the Aim for Climate Summit in Washington, DC, bringing together partners to increase and accelerate investment in support of with climate smart agriculture and food systems innovation. The summit was a historic event that raised ambition, built collaborations and shared knowledge on innovative solutions in the lead up to COP28 in the United Arab Emirates later this year. Together with our co-league for Aim for Climate, the United Arab Emirates, we are proud of what the summit accomplished. The summit's breadth, depth, and the announcements made during the event illustrate the accomplishments vividly, including announcing over now $13 billion of increased investments in climate smart agriculture and food systems innovation by Aim for Climate partners. We look forward to continuing to advance Aim for Climate in the lead up to and at COP28 later this year in Dubai. Now, additionally, at the Aim for Climate Summit, we released the USDA Science and Research Strategy for 2023 to 2026. The strategy is a bold three-year vision to make ag more profitable, productive, and sustainable, not just for a few, but for all. The strategy was developed with input from across the department and external stakeholders and partners. Within the strategy, you will all find USDA's five highest scientific priorities outlined, and they are accelerating innovative technologies and practices, driving climate smart solutions, bolstering nutrition security and health, cultivating resilient ecosystems, and translating research and into action. And I want you to just recognize all the action words in those goals. So it's not a time to be passive. It's a time to get busy. These priorities areas reflect the obstacles we face and define how USDA plans to meet this moment through science, research, and data. Given the interconnected nature of climate, food production systems, and food and nutrition security, it's essential to develop a high-level, integrated vision across multiple areas of research to ensure that these key priorities are advanced to meet the challenges of climate change. This strategy is also a call to action for you our stakeholders, and partners nationwide to join us in proposing big, audacious solutions around the priorities we've set forth. I encourage all of you, with your diverse backgrounds and expertise, to review both strategies I've mentioned today and to see where your work intersects and how you can drive these priorities forward. So thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you all today. I'm excited to be here, and I'm wishing everyone a successful and productive day of meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Shivanda, for highlighting the important work that USDA is leading in this research space and as a partner to USAID in leading the U.S. government global food security research strategy. I want to also thank Rob, Gillian, Gillian, Rob, and Shivanda for helping us to frame the day and to set the tone for the important conversations ahead on how USAID should prioritize and implement research at the nexus of climate, environment, and agri-food systems, and this afternoon, how it might make adjustments to operationalize climate strategy through its agricultural food security and nutrition policies and programming. I invite you <clears throat> to take your seats back in the audience <laughs> from the panel. Thank you. Uh, I now like to welcome Dr. Carrie Fowler and Dr. Rebecca Shaw to the stage. Um, Dr. Fowler and Dr. Shaw. Thank you. Yep, there he is. And um, first, we're going to start with Dr. Kerry Fowler. Uh, he's a special envoy for global food security at the U.S. Department of State and former executive director of the Global Crop Diversity Trust. Dr. Fowler is also a former member of BIFAD. We've asked him to share experiences with ongoing State Department work at the intersection of agricultural development and climate change research. 
Dr. Fowler, the floor is yours. Let's welcome him. Thank you. Please be seated. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, um, good, good morning. Um, I know time is short, so I'm going to jump right in. Um, as you know, the State Department is not an implementing agency. We don't have agricultural um, research and development or uh, programs on, on the ground. Uh, but we do collaborate with those who do, and we contribute through diplomacy, through leverage, and sometimes through ideas. Um, we're quite focused, and um, that has to do with the times and our own resources, and we're focused on the basics. Um, the basics to us are soils and crops. There is no such thing as food security based on poor soils and unadapted crops. So there's, there are a few factors that are really behind our thinking. Um, I'm just going to run through them very, very quickly. The first is that soil erosion and depletion are outstripping replenishment, particularly in some areas of the world like Africa. There's a slowing rate of yield increases of our major crops. Um, we're facing climate issues. La July was a 533rd consecutive month in which the global average temperature for the month exceeded the 20th century average for that month. Oceans have never been warmer, and now we're going to have an El Nino. The there are, as a result of this, projected yield decreases for some of our major crops if we look out to 2050, instead of the 50 to 60 percent yield increases that we actually need. So we assume, therefore, that the incremental yearly increases are going to be insufficient to meet food demand by 2050. This to us uh, underscores the need for increased agricultural research and development, uh, including game changers, moonshots, if you will. The current levels of agricultural research and development, <clears throat> current public expenditures, inflation adjusted, are the same as they were 50 years ago. We have new challenges, greater challenges. This is not sufficient. We need to change it. So what we've done at the State Department, I'll say very briefly, is um, promote a program we're calling VACS, V-A-C-S, the Vision for Adapted Crops and Soils. It's co-sponsored with the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN and with the African Union. It's co-chaired, our meetings are co-chaired by, by African leaders. <clears throat> On the soils front, we are promoting uh, greater soil mapping and analytics to answer questions for governments uh, focused in Africa and for farmers. The questions we want to help them answer are where to plant, what to plant, what system to use, and how to apply these things in a given season, in a different, um, given climate. On the crops front, um, I'll note that there is an African Union common position on food system. And one of the things that uh, is highlighted in that common position over and over again is that we, we, the international community, have massively underinvested in traditional and indigenous crops in Africa. We want to correct that. The logic behind that is that by diversifying these sources of nutrition, we increase resilience, and we improve nutrition. There are three steps that we're taking to do this. Um, the first is to identify the crops that we um, think have the most potential for providing additional nutritional value in the food systems. Um, we had a meeting at FAO recently where we narrowed down the list of traditional and indigenous crops from something like 300 down to 60 best bets. Um, it, in, it covered, we, we considered all categories of crops, grains, legumes, roots and tubers, tree crops, Rob, um, uh, fruits and vegetables, uh, nuts, etc. And we identified a number of crops that are traditional or indigenous that are familiar to you. So. Uh, that would be finger millet and phonio and sorghum and cassava and, and okra. But also a number of crops that aren't familiar to most people. Uh, African locust bean, spider plant, 
uh, African uh, eggplant, lop lob, uh, African yam bean, pigeon pea, bambara groundnut, that have historically been underinvested in and whose potential hasn't been realized in production systems and in nutrition. We've narrowed that list of 300 or so down to 60. And now next month, oh, what month am I in? Yes, next month, um, we will uh, look at how those crops are going to fare in a climate changed world. Because if you are going to really make an impact in nutritional and farming systems in Africa, you need to know where's your best bet nutritionally and where's your best bet in terms of production in a climate changed world. We're working with uh, Columbia University with Cynthia Rosenzweig, last year's um, Food Prize laureate, to make that kind of assessment. And on the basis of that, which are the most promising crops nutrition-wise and which can do the best in climate change, we will, I think, for the first time, have a rational basis for making crop breeding uh, investments. Um, but that's not enough. Uh, the third step is to establish a funding mechanism for that work. It needs long-term, reliable, sustainable funding. And we're working with a multilateral organization to establish a multi-donor trust fund uh, for that, that work, both on crops and, and on soils. I know that what we're promoting doesn't answer every question, and um, we'll, we will get and do get a lot of questions that start off, well, what about this and what about that? And um, unapologetically, I say we have to be focused and we have to get down to basics. And if we don't get the basics right, we won't probably get anything else right either. We have been making a good bit of progress. Uh, the U.S. government is devoting $100 million is allocated to the work that I've just described. We're seeking more. Um, I'll also mention that uh, FAO has jumped on board. They want to mainstream this kind of work in the FAO program. It's highlighted in the G7 discussions. Italy will highlight it in the upcoming, during their upcoming presidency. Um, I'll mention just one more thing, and that is that we have to have a serious discussion about the difference between short-term um, outlooks, proposals, projects, and long-term. Um, there is certainly a great bias in government and among the general public to want quick, immediate solutions to big problems. But I'll tell you that the kind of short-term projects that, that I see, as good as they are, are not going to produce transformational change. They're going to produce um, incremental change. And we have to be willing to invest seriously in agricultural research and development for the long term. And we have to invest in big ideas, moonshot ideas, because on the current trajectory, we're not going to get to where we need to be in 2050. So what does that mean? I think for all of us, it means that we need to try to help to change the discourse around this subject. We need to talk about the need for long-term uh, substantial investments in research and development. And I'm happy to say that at the State Department, we are collaborating very much with the USDA to try to accomplish that. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> as long as you stay here. <laughs> Thank you, Carrie, for sharing that important uh, and ongoing work. Uh, to offer a complimentary perspective, um, I'm pleased that we will next hear from Dr. Rebecca Shaw, a World Wildlife Fund's Chief Scientist and Senior Vice President for Global Science. Dr. Shaw will share her thoughts on the current state, aspirations, and needs of research that advances both climate and agri-food system goals. Dr. Shaw. Thank you so much. Um, and I really enjoyed sitting on the stage. Uh, so thank you for that opportunity. <laughs> 
Uh, no, actually what I really enjoyed was reading this report on operationalizing USAID's climate strategy to, to achieve transformative adaptation mitigation in agriculture and food systems. It's a mouthful, and I really enjoyed it. I, I read it three times. I, for somebody who works on this, uh, my background is in climate and its impacts on ecosystems, including, including uh, agricultural ecosystems. And, um, and of course, biodiversity. And when you read this report, it is synthetic like you don't often see in, in a vision for how you could move uh, forward systemic and transformational change. And all of us in this community are talking about transformational change. And then it kind of stops there. Well, what this report did for me, what this report I think is going to do for many of us, is it's going to advance the conversation about how you actually do that in an, in an institution as large as the USAID in a way that actually could be meaningful, trans, truly transformative, and in a learning environment. It's the kind of report that those of us have been calling, again, calling for transformational change, can now point to as a significant advancement in the thinking. Uh, the report represents a substantial uh, uh, focus on the food systems in the context of the changed meat, health, economic, social, environmental, and climate, both mitigation and adaptation goals. And I, I truly congratulate all of you involved in the report. It, it is really a beautiful piece of work. With respect to the environment, and I know I don't need to tell you all this, but I am going to do it because it's my job to do this. Our food system, <clears throat> is responsible, as you saw in the report, anywhere from 30 to 37 percent of anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions, depending on how you, how you uh, do the analysis. It's the main driver of deforestation, particularly in the tropics. It's the main driver of biodiversity loss, and it's responsible for 70 percent of all freshwater withdrawals. And we know the problems we're having across the planet, both with respect to um, water availability and uh, freshwater biodiversity. With respect to health, of course, the food system is critically important. One in three people are overweight or obese. One in 12 are hungry and malnourished. No country is on track to meet its 2025 nutrition targets. And the leading cause of, uh, of total disease burden is now non-communicable diseases largely associated with the food system. So this is a six systemic issue we're trying to uh, deal with. And I want to I want to keep us focused on and broad. And I, I do appreciate, uh, uh, Dr. Fowler, the, the need to focus on, on focus. But we also need to keep the big picture in mind of where we're pushing this entire system. This is a triple challenge of addressing climate, of course, food systems that affect us all, and nature loss. This is a system in need of intervention, and I know that this report talks a lot about what that intervention can be. And it really calls for uh, siloed, act, uh, the, to move away from siloed action on production, on consumption, on food loss and waste. And this report recognizes there is no one food system. I think this is really important. We think of this as a monolithic system. It is not monolithic. It is really different and really contextual. It spans environment, economy, and society. And the report recognizes that you have to understand the nuances in place, the balance between the co-benefits and the trade-offs, and by geography, now and through time and in the context of climate change. What it calls for, then, is the need to pr pr approach this uh, systemically. USAID and, and this in, in uh, <clears throat> its leadership in developing this report has really outlined that the food system is a great opportunity for us to restore nature, to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees, to nourish all the people within the planetary boundaries while adapting to climate change and leaving a whole planet. I, I absolutely love that the USAID has put a MEL system in place, monitoring, evaluation, and learning system in a place to understand <clears throat> how and under what conditions interventions will achieve their intended targets. I love the targets. I love the design and the systems design associated with this 
with uh, implementing those targets. And I love the, that monitoring and evaluation piece. And the reason why I love it so much is we don't have a budget anywhere near uh, USAID's of the World Wildlife Fund, but we need to be partnering together. We need to have the information that the implementation of the research in this report will actually highlight. As you may know, WWF has been thinking about this, uh, and we have uh, uh, developed a report called The Great Food Puzzle, looking at 20 levers to scale national action to, um, and to uh, assist stakeholders in doing so. It, it defines six variables as key, key import, keyly imp important, the production system, the self-sufficiency of a food system within a national context, food security, consumption patterns, of course, biodiversity, and finally, irrecoverable carbon. It explicitly identifies a handful of key transformation levers that can be assessed in all countries and provides a way to move forward. Highlighted in this report also is the focus on natural resource management and how important not just soil management and soil health is, but land use management, the management and restoration of biodiversity and carbon storage and will be to understanding how we make our food systems whole to sustain our planet. It also focuses on governance, education and knowledge, technology as this uh, USAID report does, and trade and finance. The reason I, I, I outline for you what this solving the great food puzzle is all about, it is a big puzzle. How these interventions achieve the targets will be very different in different contexts, as I said. And we need to take a systemic approach, analyze it in the constant, uh, context of, of a system, but also have that monitoring, evaluation, and learning to share the, the outcomes of the research as quickly as possible. So this <clears throat> when implemented with a rigorous research program with a focus and platform on an evidence for learning, and an eco in an ecosystem context, this work can help all of us respond to the changes we face in a time scale that's, that's relevant. So again, I want to congratulate the panel for a fantastic start, and I look forward to partnering with USAID and others to uh, learn and lean forward together on this important endeavor. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, for that very interesting presentation. Carrie and Rebecca, you've both given us in the room a, and online uh, much to consider, and your complimentary perspectives set up our next panel conversation very well. All of our framing speakers this morning will be available to respond to questions after the panel discussion coming up next. So please do hold any questions for them and make a note to circle back to them. For our virtual audience, please share your questions in the Q&A box on Zoom, and we look forward to addressing your comments or questions also. To dive a bit deeper into some of these research topics and their implications, we'll now turn to BIFAD subcommittee member, Dr. Mario Herrero, Professor of Global Development and Director of Food Systems and Global Change at Cornell University to lead a panel conversation with experts working in these areas. Now, Mario, I invite you and your colleagues to join me on the stage. <laughs> Let's welcome them. <laughs> Thank you, Lawrence. I've been looking forward to this conversation and I'm delighted to introduce this exceptional group of experts to take on this very challenging topic. So who do we have here? We have um, Anthony Chapotto, Director of Research and Innovation in Daba Agricultural Policy Institute, Zambia. Uh, we have Kate Broman, Deputy Director of the Water Global Water Security Center at the University of Alabama. We have uh, Bambi Semrock, Senior Vice President of the Center for Sustainable Lands and Waters, Conservation International, 
and Professor Jessica Fanso, BIFAT subcommittee member and Professor of Climate and Director of the Food for Humanity Initiative at Columbia University. Before we start uh, this uh, round of questions to the panel, I want to make up just a few remarks just to set the scene and start by saying that we, we are not in a business as usual world. We are a, at a time where we're asking an enormous amount of things from the land and from, from people. It's, it's really difficult. We want food, we want nutrition, we want jobs, we want incomes, we want environmental protection and a range of other things. And some of, some of these topics, like nutrition, like environment, like equity, need to be included by design in everything that we do. It's no longer optional just to have programs that don't address these explicitly. At the moment, all donors are internalizing agendas on, on climate change, and this is essential that we actually uh, build programs that will support uh, these environmental goals that governments have also signed as part of the Paris Agreement, uh, as part of their NAMAS and everything. They, they are all going to have policies and targets that we need to actually support as we do global agricultural development. So how do we do this for USAID? This is the kind of question that we are trying to uh, to, to help here with. And we have this phenomenal people here to give us a, a lot of help in, in achieving this. So I'm going to start with, with a few questions. They sat in the wrong orders, uh, but that's okay, you know, we can, we can manage that. Uh, but I'm going to start here with, with Bambi. Okay, Bambi, uh, as I said, we're asking a lot from, from the land. If we wanted to improve land management, what are the key things that we should be focusing on? Thank you, Mark. Is that working? Perhaps the other one? Is that one here? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. That one works. Thank you. Thank you, Mario, and it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, so not an easy question, of course, and as I was trying to think about how to prepare remarks for, for this session, I was talking to my son, who's 11, and he's like, Mom, what are you going to say? What do you tell the government you know, of the United States to do on, on agriculture? And I was like, well, you know, you like ice cream, right? <laughs> he's like, yeah, where does ice cream come from? Cows. Okay, so what are you going to do about cows? He's like, well, how did they get, they get cooler? Right? So if the world is heating up, how do you cool down and de-stress cows? And he was like, well, you could put fans on them, you can move them inside. And I was like, well, what about trees? And he's like, yeah, you could put them under shade too. And I'm like, well, that's kind of what we're trying to talk about here. And in the nutshell, it's like, okay, how do we do that on a grander scale in a more systemic approach than ever? And we can't just tell people what to do. We have to provide incentives. We have to understand behavior change. It's a very, as Rebecca and others have said, it's a systemic approach but we have to understand who are our clients, who are we working with, and who are the managers of these lands, and it's farmers. We need to understand what are they doing today, and what are the challenges that are lying ahead of them. And everything that we end up doing at Conservation International with other partners, it's really about what do we understand about today and about tomorrow that enables us to better engage with people who are managing these lands. And a lot of times, we don't know you know, what to tell them to do. We can model out the effects of climate change into the future on coffee. We've done that. We've looked at, you know, where coffee can be grown in the future, where it's grown today, how much land might be at risk from deforestation from coffee, how much land might be moving out of coffee and into something else. And then all those questions, we need to look at it from a point of view of like, what do the people want to be doing in the future? But what, these were coffee farmers, so what the, where does the coffee go? And so what we did is we did research to try and figure out, okay, what does this mean for coffee? What does it mean for the planet? And what does it mean for these people? And when you think about it in that way and you ask those, those three basic questions, you can get to some really critical answers in terms of, well, if we need to double the amount of coffee produced by 2050 to meet global demand, that's going to take a lot more land. 
At the same time, coffee is one of those vulnerable crops to climate change. And so we know that 50% of the suitable area for coffee is not going to be there in 2050. So if we can map where we're going to see decreases in, in the area available for coffee production, we can see kind of lands that might become more suitable for coffee production, and we can see lands that are going to, you know, as coffee goes up the mountainside, we're going to see more conflict in terms of forest areas and land use change. We have the resources now to do all of that, but we're not doing it in a systematic way across commodities, right? And we're not necessarily getting all that information into the hands of key decision makers. We did that five, six years ago for coffee. We never had the funding to do it for cocoa, for palm oil, for all the other commodities that we would need to do that for. Um, so that's where I think we need this more systematic approach. And we know that you know, we currently have about 38% of land under cropland and pasture globally. We also know that we might need 600 million more hectares of, of land to feed the, the, the population of the future. So what's going to happen is we can meet part of that through dietary changes, and part of that needs to come from productivity changes. Okay, so how do we get to those productivity changes? It's all the things I just said in terms of, you know, making sure we understand where we could take maybe coffee is becoming less suitable, what is it going to change into? Can we keep it under agroforestry systems and can we not turn it into pasture? Can we look at where there's degraded lands and figure out, okay, are there opportunities to take those degraded lands and make them more productive um, and put agroforestry, silver pastoral systems in place so that we get climate productivity improvements and market improvements? And the market side is really critical too because in order to get this all to scale, we have to work on markets and policy changes so that we can actually um, systematically drive these changes um, at a much larger um, scale and get to that transformative approach that we're talking about. But that's just for, like I said, I've, I've focused on like coffee because that's what I've worked on for 20 plus years. But it's like we have to take that approach and apply it across so many different commodities and take this more whole systems approach. Because when you do it on a commodity by commodity approach, we assume that farmers are just growing one thing and they're not. They're growing multiple things. So we also have to think about, okay, what's that whole farm look like? What's the whole farm approach? And how are those farms situated in the landscape? And how are the markets and the policy decisions driven by companies and governments changing and influencing behavior on the ground? So if we can create jurisdictional approaches, landscape scale initiatives to drive that level of collaboration and change, get the policy and market incentives right, figure out you know, how this land use change is actually going to drive um, changes on the ground, then we can get to a vision, we can get to an investment strategy, we can get to a research strategy that's really going to support these producers. Thank, thank you very much. That was very clear. So I'll follow up uh, uh, with a question for, for Professor Fanso. Um, what are some of the research pathways to address both nutrition and climate change through food systems? And also where does research on diets uh, fit in all this strategy as well. Great, thanks Mario. Um, so I think you, know, you, you'll look through the report and there's not a lot on diets and nutrition and I think we still have time to change that and I'll come back to that a bit later but um, diets is the centerpiece that brings together climate, food systems, health and nutrition. Diets are so critical. They're the place where supply and demand meet. Because at the end of the day, all of you consume food, you engage with the food system every day, you make choices in food environments about what you're gonna eat. And that is the centerpiece. And I think we know that uh, pre-COVID, it's interesting because global nutrition was not improving as fast as it could. Diets are actually worsening in health. People can't access healthy diets. 3.2 billion people cannot afford a healthy diet, which is incredible when you think about those numbers. And the question is why? Why pre-COVID were some global health indicators improving? Child mortality was coming down. But why was malnutrition worsening around the world? And in the sordid history of food security and now what we're calling food systems and all of the research and development work we've done, something has not gone well. 
if we have such a massive burden of malnutrition, every country deals with at least one form. Diets are not accessible. They're not sustainable. They're moving towards being more unsustainable. They're often not safe, and they're not nutritious. So we have a lot of work to do as the international development community to ensure that people can access diets. And there's a lot of unanswered research questions. What do people eat around the world? How is climate going to impact those diets? How do we reduce the environmental footprint of diets while ensuring that people can still meet their nutritional needs and get access in equitable ways? These are huge questions that the nutrition community is trying to understand. But we as the nutrition community also need to sit at the table of the climate scientists. We need to sit at the table of agronomists and those who work on agroecology or regenerative agriculture. So I often, nutritionists were very good at blaming <laughs> the ag community historically. We rumble about the green revolution and all of these other um, historic uh, food security initiatives, but we too have to sit at the table, not the one that we have set, but the one that's set, that's set by others. So um, it's a hard space though, because we don't really know what people are eating around the world. All that data is largely modeled. We don't really understand. We don't understand what drives people's choices. People say it's price, it's taste, it's convenience. It's a lot of things. And we don't understand people's constraints, particularly if they're moving and migrating. So these are all very much on the agenda for research. Climate is going to make it all the more difficult to access healthy, nutritious diets. The livestock question is a huge one with diets. How do we get some populations, populations to consume less animal source foods, bump up others that need a bit more? Big ethical conundrums here of how to, who has to sacrifice what and where and why. Um, so there, it's, it's quite a, a research agenda. I hope um, US takes this on more. Um, there's a lot of political wrangling when we start to get into the conversation of diets. Uh, it's become a political debate when it shouldn't be. Um, and uh, so I think, you know, with that is a, a lot of political economy questions too that we need to deal with. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I fully agree with you. Now I'm going to go to uh, Kate. Well, it seems to me that we might need some water in all of this, huh? <laughs> um, so, uh, what do you think are the research priorities for water management and climate adaptation, and, and how, how would USAID really need to engage in this area differently? All right, is this one working now? No, trade you back. <laughs> Well, obviously, we should all be paying attention to water. <laughs> it's, it's the most important thing, and yet it's not the point. And I think that's one of the things that's really important to remember in the agricultural and nutrition research portfolio, that we always have to consider water in every decision. But we're never trying to get water out of this. We're trying to get food and nutrition and livelihoods out of this. And so water, and in many ways climate, because water will be a huge part of the climate story, needs to be interwoven into everything and not siloed as its own piece of the puzzle. And that's also really important because for better or for worse, the water cycle diagram that you learned in the fourth grade basically works. <laughs> and whenever we change the way we're using water, we are engaging in a trade-off. So if we're thinking about expanding irrigation, which has really important implications for sustainable, ongoing, productive agricultural systems, that water was going somewhere. And wasteful water use, 
that waste is going somewhere. And we see this frequently when we try to improve efficiency in water systems, where, for example, by improving the efficiency of irrigation or starting irrigation, we end up draining a wetland downstream because all of that groundwater that people are tapping was going somewhere before, and people were making use of the reeds and the animals and the plants that were growing in that wetland. So I think the first thing we have to remember as we integrate water questions into research questions is, what is the trade-off? And is that a trade-off that we wanna make? It doesn't mean that we shouldn't make it, we just need to be cognizant of it. This should never come as a surprise. I think the other piece of this is that as we think about changing climate and we think about what the, the challenges and threats to rain-fed agriculture in particular are gonna bring, the thing that we can expect the most is that we can't anticipate the future. Um, we're pretty darn sure that temperatures are going up. There's a little bit of argument about exactly how much. The precipitation projections are all over the map. And what that means is that we need to think about flexibility, that we take advantage of irrigation when it makes a big difference, that we don't irrigate when we don't need it, that we think about systems that can fail sometimes and not be catastrophic, that we can have a bad crop year and it doesn't bring the whole system down. And I think, you know, as we move forward, bringing water and climate into all of these other areas of research, remembering that flexibility is going to be critical. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So Anthony, uh, I see that you're Director of Research and Innovation, and I want to ask a, a technological question. I think that there's many technocrats in, in, in us here, and I think that, you know, technology is going to solve the climate problem uh, in, in, in more than one way. At least that's the belief. But at the same time, we see adoption rates really not picking up at the rates that we really need to. So what do we need to do? What are the solutions to increase adoption rates of all these things? And how can USA really incorporate some of the concepts into their programs? Thank you. Thank you very much. You can, yeah. Thank you very much. I also was wondering, uh, this question is very tough. <laughs> I, th I, I thought that, but, uh, you know, it's, it, it's one of those big elephant in the room questions. Yeah, so. I, I work in the policy space, so I face challenges to convince uh, our government to change or implement programs, make good recommendations, but you find that implementation is very it's hard to come by. And for USAID, you work in the same space as well. Issues to do with uh, policy is very key. Issues to do with governance is very key. Issues to do with the market system is very key. And all those things are intertwined. There is no shortage of technical knowledge. But most of the knowledge that has been generated, you find that we are failing to either domesticate it we are failing to have it uh, uh, adopted by the people we are designing. So, so as a policy analyst and researcher coming from a developing country, the first thing is for us to understand the people we are trying to serve. They really live in very tough environments. So we can have solutions, but if those solutions uh, cannot fit into the set of incentives for these people we are trying to say, you find that they won't ad adopt them. So I think as USID is trying to invest in these vulnerable environments and vulnerable, I mean, in, in, in trying to change uh, 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 hearts and minds, trying to change behavior, it is important to think about incentives. What is it that is required to change behavior? 
Smallholder farmers think about financial gains, not economic gains. It's like for us, we put in the equation, we say, okay, this is going to help out in the future. But they think short term. If we don't give them something that can uh, help them mitigate the short term needs, they are not going to adopt it. So it's important for us to try to find out the set of incentives, the set of programs, the set of regulations that, are, that will incentivize behavior change. If we do it right, we'll start to see increased ad uh, 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 adoption of, of the solutions that will make our world a better place. Um, I think the other issue is, I think, issue of co-creation. If we don't co-create the solutions with the people we are trying to sell, forget that we are going to be able to make them adopt, adopt to this. Uh, uh, I mean, to the solutions we are trying to 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 to, to uh, get them to adopt. I mean, I can give you a good example before I close. If you go to a rural uh, 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 farm, they use charcoal. And charcoal is made, they have to cut down trees. And, and we both, but they use charcoal to cook. So if we come and say, please don't cut down the trees and not give them an alternative of another cooking, uh, I mean, another energy source for cooking, forget that they will, yeah. they will not cut down the trees. So we need to be able to incentivize them to change their behavior. We need to pay for change, changes in behavior. If we don't pay, I can bet you, I think it will be very difficult for us to Thank get you very the much. need. Thank you. Wonderful. I'm going to do a, a, another round, of that, uh, but please answer very succinctly. Bambi, land sparing versus land sharing in, in low and middle income countries. And where does that, where those two co concepts fit? In, in the USA research agenda? We need both, right? We need to understand where we can increase productivity, so we need research on yield gaps and, and yield levels, um, how we close those yield levels in those areas where you know, we can produce and we can continue to produce into the future. And then we need the incentives um, for conservation of the areas where we actually don't want agriculture to go. So we know we have reserves of irrecoverable carbon that Rebecca spoke to, that we've mapped around the world. Um, these are areas that if we lose the carbon, we will not be able to replace by mid-century. So we will never meet our Paris targets if we lose those places. So we need incentives for farmers to actually not go into those areas. We need incentives for farmers to plant new trees. We need incentives for farmers to keep um, forest area on their lands and protect the water resources that are on their lands as well. That's payment for environmental services, that's Red Plus, those are those types of mechanisms that we have to get to scale. And we also, I think, need to understand where are we producing which crops? We have horrible maps of where we're producing crops right now around the world. We need to improve that if we're ever going to understand what's really driving land use change, which crops are driving that land use change, so that then you can actually start to provide the right um, information to the land users to drive those changes forward. Thank you. Jessica, the livestock question. Where are we on livestock product consumption in low and middle income countries? And what's the, the, role, of, of uh, the role of changes in consumption in mitigation? Well, it, it, traditionally, livestock products are expensive. You know, there's significant food supply chain issue, infrastructure issues in some parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, South, Southeast Asia, where particularly deeply rural areas. But the demand is changing as people have more disposable income. We're seeing a demand for animal source foods rise. Um, more chicken, more pork, more beef, if that is available, goat, you know, that, but in some places still, it's a luxury. You know, I work a lot in Timor-Leste, and those foods are only consumed during weddings or funerals, so there's, 
a change as the economic growth happens in these countries, particularly seeing growth of animal uh, source food consumption in places like China, um, East Africa. There's a lot of growth in the livestock sector in places like Ethiopia. Um, but it'll be interesting to watch the alt protein space to see the consumer acceptance in this space. You go to the supermarket in Nairobi and you're already seeing some of these products, so it's already hitting um, the shelves. But with all that, the larger concern in the nutrition community are these highly or sometimes called ultra-processed foods that are moving everywhere. You find them in deeply rural areas. And these are incredibly detrimental to human health and the evidence base is growing for those. So we have a livestock question and issues around environmental sustainability, sustainability in small amounts. Animal source foods are very nutrient dense. You get a lot of power in a small amount. Um, but we have this whole ultra processed food, highly traded, highly stable, super cheap, super tasty foods moving around the world. And so we need to, if we're all working in food systems, we need to think of the balance of all foods, the whole plethora of foods that are available to people, and what are the big concerns from a public health perspective. Now, when you add on climate, there's a whole question around ultra-processed foods and their environmental footprint. Um, but um, that's an, un an unanswered question right now. So I think the livestock question is important, but let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. There's a yep. whole range of foods that we need to be looking at when we're thinking about a healthy diet. Absolutely. Fantastic. Uh, OK, Kate, uh, a lot has been said. Where would you put the balance between research on water and research on, on soil management? This is a question that, that comes very often in, in this kind of work, and if you had to deal with some priority setting, what, what are the kinds of things that you would do to really uh, ensure that you know, one doesn't overshadow the other? Yes, and <laughs> <laughs> um, these are really complementary. And obviously, soil health is really important as part of plant water cycling. Um, you can store more water in healthier soils, and so you have better flexibility as you come into dry periods. There's a lot of benefits to having healthy soils. That said, soils don't make water. <laughs> and so if you don't have enough water, it doesn't really matter how healthy your soil is. You're still gonna run into problems, and you still need to think about irrigation or crops that have different kinds of tolerances for extended dry periods. And so I think that this really needs to go hand in hand. You would not want to consider irrigation without considering your soil health, nor would you want to think about soil health exclusive of irrigation in the places where that really matters. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And Anthony, how can we strengthen the work that USA does with, a, with national partners? And, and where's the balance of, of roles and and the kind of work that gets done. No, thank, thank you very much. I, I think local knowledge is very key, I think, in, in trying to effect uh, a sustainable change. So it is important, I think, to team up um, with uh, credible local institutions, because usually the local institutions know the, uh, their, their, their local landscape and particularly those uh, institutions that uh, are very effective in stakeholder engagement. Because stakeholder engagement is, uh, is, is key because that's the only way you can unlock that local, local knowledge. Uh, and also, it is important to support these local institutions by providing um, capacity as well as uh, providing backstopping uh, support, because they really require that backstopping support in order to, 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 to work effectively. And last but not least, I think it's important to really commit to long-term partnership 
short term i think is is dr fala has indicated short term uh, support is not sustainable i think you see if you want to really change things particularly in the policy governance and uh, space usually you need a long uh, that long term partnership so it's very important i think that uh, we invest in that and that way we will be able to i think to 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 be able to have the change we need thank you Thank you very much. Well, look, this is all very interesting and there is a lot to discuss here. Uh, but w we would really like to hear from the audience, both in the room and, and online. So uh, my colleague and fellow subcommittee member, Dr. Andrew Mohammed, will join us to moderate this conversation. Andrew is a professor and the Blazing Game Chair of Excellence in Agricultural Policy at the University of Tennessee Institute of Agriculture. Andrew. Welcome. I'm looking to your to your questions as well. Okay, so. uh, thank you, Mario. Uh, so we want to do this in two parts. And so first, what I'd like to do is just want to give uh, uh, some in quick instructions. And so if you'd like to ask a question, just um, fully introduce yourself, your affiliation, as well as the actual panelists you'd like to ans answer your question. And so just keep that in mind, because we do want to keep this as a part of the public record. But at this time, what I'd like to do is just go to reactions from the BIFAT committee. And so first, why don't we start with you, Lawrence, with either a question or a reaction. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I did have a quick question, and it's a broad question, uh, I guess, but uh, uh, we've talked about de-siloing um, uh, and, and doing more integrated research and work uh, in, this, in this area. And, and, and I guess my question is, I mean, it's, we, we'll probably get a lot of consensus around that. However, um, we all know that it is easier said than done. What, what, what do you see of some of the particular barriers toward de-siloing and, and, and integration and even collaboration uh, uh, in the research and work in these very vital areas? And uh, how do we overcome? Uh, for the sake of time, we may only need just, just one panel. I think everyone yeah. could, could answer this and probably have different perspectives, but I mean, Working across disciplines is incredibly challenging and incredibly time consuming, and no one has time. Languages spoken are different, methodologies are different. So it create, it, it's a lot of effort to do it and to do it well with high quality output. Um, and I would argue that I think it's necessary to really try to come to the table. I don't think, though, you need to really learn deeply languages and methods and methodologies. You bring your expertise and your specialty to the table. And Mario and I were just talking late last night about remembering your specialty, because that's why you're sitting together in this collective entity to work together. And so. You don't need to become an expert in everything, but you're bringing your expertise to the table. And I think sometimes we all forget about that. I forget sometimes I'm a nutritionist by training. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I think it's, it's time consuming. It requires a lot of more social skills and, and, and shepherding and curating, less about becoming an expert in every field. So. Yeah, that, that's my two cents. Yeah, and, and, and that initial recognition that the problem is systemic, you know, just trying to incorporate the different elements, like, for example, water and so on, trying to think of how what we're trying to do would influence the, the other different components. I think that that's essential. Uh, but but there, is, there is a systemic difficulty in doing this in low and middle income countries because usually the departments are very siloed. You know, you have to talk to the Ministry of, of Livestock or, or to the people doing the crops and so on, and it will require a lot of effort to bring more people together. 
But I think that Feed the Future has circumvented at least some of those uh, constraints and it's becoming, well, more common but slow to, to do more systems projects. All right, thank you. And so I see I, I actually have two jobs, not just to sort of keep you all short, but I got to keep this group uh, short as well, just to make sure we stay within time. No, no, excellent. Thank you. And so next, I'd like to turn to um, a fellow ag economist, a colleague of mine, also on the BIFAD committee. Uh, so, Ada, um, do you have a question for the panel? Is she still on? Yes, I am, and unfortunately, I can't. Um, I can't put on my video, so I'll just. Um, I'll just proceed. So, thank you so much to the panelists. Really excellent discussion. Um, I just have a, a two-part question for Dr. Anthony Chapoto. Um, so, we have talked a bit in BIFAD about um, the USAID and sort of broadly donor interest in this localization agenda. So, your research institute in Daba is a member of a regional network of policy research centers, ANAPRI. And so I have a two-part question for you. First is, what are some specific roles that regional networks like ANAPRI can play in this localization agenda and in strengthening the relationship between environmental, ag, nutrition, and food systems research programming in sub-Saharan Africa? And then the second part is short. <laughs> it's just that how can regional networks like ANAPRI be supported by donor agencies and US universities and research system to fill these roles. If you could provide a, you know, just a couple of concrete examples, I think that would be very helpful for us. Thank you. Thank you. No, so thank you very much, Sorida, for that question. Uh, I am the technical chair of ANAPRI, that's the African Network for Regional, uh, I mean, for, for Agriculture Policy Research Institutes. Um, see, the glory of working in a network particularly in Africa, is that, uh, that we share knowledge, we share research findings. Most often, we, most of these countries face similar challenges. So since we face similar challenges, we cross learn. You know, it's like as we share, share uh, ideas, you find that we can be able to find solutions that, that say, for example, in, in Zambia, we have a problem that might be similar, the same problem that is, a, say, in Zimbabwe, Malawi, Nigeria. So basically working through a network, I think it helps us uh, be able to learn from each other, um, to share that knowledge. To me, that's very critical. And then the second part is how can USID um, uh, help, I think, support the work of ANAPRI, I mean, I can give you a good example. Right now, ANAPRI is uh, part, is, is implementing one of the USID initiative, which is uh, CASI, that is the Comprehensive uh, Action for Climate Change Initiative. ANAPRI is implementing the pilot in two countries, Zambia and Ghana. And then we have another African partner, another think tank in, based in Rwanda, Academia 2063, they are implementing in Rwanda and Senegal. So you can see that uh, the support that ANAPRI is receiving from USAID to work with their governments, because we know our governments better than anybody else. So that support is helping to unlock the solutions. The things that I was talking about, stakeholder engagement, for example, you find that we are better placed to engage the government. So we need that support to continue to unlock the solutions and be able to, 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 to change uh, the landscape. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anthony. So next, let's turn to Kathy Spong. So, no, so next, let's go to Henry. Henri, yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, since I'm on corporate sector. So we are all doing work in these different areas and um, it, we do it from what we think we should be doing versus what we know we should be doing. And I think partnerships, I mean we need to work more with what 
USAID is doing and get alignment because we're all doing these little things all over the place that may not be adding up to the way it could add up. Can you give some thoughts on that? Let's let one panelist address that and try to be as short as possible if you can. I can try to take that question. I mean, one thing that we've done is with the coffee sector, we've pulled together the Sustainable Coffee Challenge as a way of trying to create that, that vehicle for sharing. Um, we do that with other projects too, like in Sub-Saharan Africa, we do learning networks to bring together herders from different pro projects that are invested in there in terms of what are we learning about rangeland management, range restoration, and, and better kind of management practices for the herds themselves. So I think if you can build that into the, the funding that you're providing and making sure that that is a, a core essential element of the, of the agenda, then you, you can facilitate that type of, of, of knowledge sharing and, and hopefully uptake as well. All right, thank you. And so next we'll go to Marie Boyd. Thank you, and, and thanks to the, the panelists. Um, one of the questions I have is, how should we think about food safety in the context of climate change? Are there particular areas where research is needed? I can start us off. Um, it's such a great question, and interestingly, talking about working collectively a lot of the nutrition community, community often doesn't work with the food safety community, which is fascinating. And FAO now has just merged their food system division with their food safety division, which I think is an important signal about how important the food water interfaces with food safety. I think with climate change and climate variability, extreme weather events, when we, there's a lot of uncertainty about the types of pathogens uh, foodborne illnesses that could result from that, waterborne illnesses. There's a lot of work being done in this space, um, but um, there's a lot of questions too. I think the extreme weather events, the immediate now casting issues, subseasonal issues of more climate variability in the extreme weather events is the really unknown and the more immediate issues related to food and waterborne illnesses cutting off access to, to healthy sources of food, healthy water sources, safe water sources. So I think it's vast, um, the concerns and research questions. I don't know if you want to say anything on the water side, because they're so closely related when it comes time to, to food and water safety. Yeah. yeah, I think this is a place um, where a couple of topics that are probably close to all of our hearts, which is food systems and wash, mm -hmm. intersect in really important ways. Um, because while if you look globally and even locally, by far the way that we use the most water is in the actual growing of crops. Um, hygiene, both for food safety and at a personal level, is also really, really critical to have water available for. What the big difference here is, is that with hygiene, depending on how we're using it, we can often reuse that water. And it could go into agriculture in productive ways. And so thinking about bringing these together, what's upstream, what's downstream, how do we think about planning so that um, we can make use of some of these systems together and we're gonna reuse the water. I used to live in Minnesota and used to joke a lot about where our wastewater goes. Hi, St. Louis! Uh, <laughs> Now I live in Alabama, it all goes into the, go into the Gulf. Um, but really thinking about you know, what's upstream and how do we leverage that? How do we take advantage of what's possible? Oh, thank you. And last, we'll go to you, Adam. Oh, Thank you very much. First of all, I really want to compliment the subcommittee. They did a great job. I was very pleased to see the report on drought stress being aggravated by climate change. And this problem was addressed by Asia in 70s and 80s by increasing the irrigated area to 37% of cropland. In Sub-Saharan Africa, the irrigated area of cropland is 6%. The question to the committee is, how would you propose to change the drought resistance 
by making irrigation in a modern way from 6% to let's say 25% in the near future. Oh, that's a good one. There's not a right answer to that. <laughs> There's a lot of answers to that, I think, is really the, is, is the key. And I think this comes back to, to actually both of the points that I brought up earlier. So the first one is about flexibility. It's clear that we need more irrigation throughout Africa and actually in lots of places in the world in order to improve productivity and to stabilize productivity. It's also very clear that irrigation is usually developed as a hard infrastructure solution that is very permanent and that people use really hard and they use a lot of water as much as they can, as long as they can, as soon as they have access to it. And so we need to think about both physical but also very much policy situations where we can make things like agriculture more flexible, or irrigation more flexible, so that we're only using irrigation as a supplement and not as a full season second crop when there's no rainfall at all. Um, it's very difficult to convince farmers to do that because they see that they can obviously get a whole second crop out of this and they want to make use of it. Um, so this becomes much more of a policy issue than, a, um, than an infrastructure or a built solution issue. The other thing about much of Africa that's quite interesting is there seems to be a substantial amount of fossil groundwater there. And, you know, that's one place where you don't have a huge trade-off in terms of who's using the water. But you only get it once. So you want to make sure you're really doing something you want to be doing with it. And this, again, I, is, a, this is a values question. I can't solve that problem with better irrigation systems. That is a, a policy and values question that I can help explain what the trade-offs are. But there's not a right answer. And it's going to be a multifaceted challenge. And the better that we can allow those policy conversations and questions to move forward, the better we're going to be able to, to come to equitable and just ways of expanding irrigation and stabilizing our agriculture. Thank you. So now let's turn to the audience. And so I see some hands up already. And so if you can, just stand up. Um, there's a microphone. Give your name, affiliation, and, uh, and which panelists you'd like to address your question. Hi, uh, good morning, folks. I guess my question is for everybody. I'm David Hughes, the director of the Current and Emerging Threats to Crops Innovation Lab. We've just gone through the hottest summer in 120,000 years, and that will be the coldest summer for the rest of your life. So then the question is, how do we wake up every day thinking about that? Because the problem with the climate crisis is it becomes a large, difficult problem to approach. How do we work on it such that we can have immediate solutions, some of which Professor Lal is talking about? Thank you. Let's try to keep it to one minute, yes. so if you see me. <laughs> no, a matter of fact, to maybe 30 seconds. 30 seconds. The climate issue is real, and I think we need policy solutions, I think, uh, that uh, to address these challenges. So we need to be able to, to green our policies. I think the problem is that we are not greening the policies fast enough to respond to the challenges. So we need to invest in greening those policies, be it our budget, budgets, our investment strategies, our programs, our regulations, so, but we need to think green throughout the whole process to be able to solve the problem. Thank you. Yes. Hi, thanks. Sarah Gamage, The Nature Conservancy, um, the Latin America region. I have a question really ex to sort of make more explicit governance in some of the trade-offs that we're talking about, and particularly I think it shows up in the water discussion of, of trade-offs, but how do we explicitly account for water rights and governance in our research in a way that really emphasizes that it's, these trade-offs aren't neutral to that? Um, it's a great question, because it's something that we're really bad at. Uh, hydrologists love hydrologic models possibly as much as agronomists love agricultural models. <laughs> and 
what we tend to not take into account are these non-biophysical constraints. And we have to. We actually spent a lot of time in Latin America talking to folks who were putting um, water conservation, land conservation for water plans into effect. And one of the big questions we were asking them was, well, how are you using hydrologic models? What do you do with hydrologic information? And the answer was, we kind of want to know if this is basically a good idea or not. Like your fancy SWOT model, eh, is this good or bad? Like directionality, maybe magnitude. Because the universe of other constraints from the FARC is up there, obviously we're not putting a project into place, um, to water rights and other kinds of customary um, rights and, and responsibilities put such big limitations on the way information was used, we were just modeling the wrong things. <laughs> and that is something that's incredibly important in terms of the research agenda, that we need to think about how people make decisions and what their non-biophysical constraints are, or none of these models are doing us much good at all. Thank you. So now let's go to an online question. Um, Thank you. And we actually have 200 participants online just about, and they've been very active, so hopefully we can get to a few. But this is Mara Russell from Care USA. Um, she has a question going back to Dr. Fowler's presentation. She's interested to learn more about um, the discussion of the potential to use local indigenous foods that support improved nutrition. Beyond identifying the crops, how do we ensure that they are adopted, produced, and ensure producers can in earn income? and also understand the, the dietary benefits. Okay, um, thank you. Well, you know, many of these crops um, have been grown and eaten in Africa for 10,000 years. Uh, they are there. Uh, in some cases, the nutritional values are not well understood, but they're pretty well understood, and um, provide a really important supplement to the, to the foods that are already, already being eaten. I think one of, the, one of the challenges for these particular crops, and by the way, many of them are mostly tended by women, uh, which is one of the big attractions to me personally, because <coughs> crops that are grown by women tend to improve the nutritional well-being of women and children, uh, and there's a big problem with stunting and wasting, as you well know, in, in Africa. Um, but I think one of the real issues that we have to contend with going forward is that because of the underinvestment in these crops, yields and other um, important factors are, are missing, and they compete with crops uh, that may not be doing so well in the future in climate change. So one of the keys to um, adoption and use of these crops is actually improving productivity so that they become a, uh, a viable option for farmers. Thank you. And so, Thank you. I'm Dave Shirley with Michigan State University in the um, Food Security Policy, Innovation Lab for Food Security Policy Research, Capacity and Influence, PRCI. So I think it's a really encouraging report, and it proposes with its longer time horizon, the beyond five years programming, kind of a fundamental change that I think would make USAID's existing focus on design and implementation much more realistic and feasible, right? However, I think there's one big missing part, okay? And I want to link this to David's uh, question here. On the one hand, we have the absolute imperative of getting policies, regulations, investments in place quickly to address climate change. On the other hand, the only way that those things are going to be actually taken up and actually implemented over time is if they have local buy-in and if their policies and programs and so forth that are in fact implementable in the, in, the, um, in the policy systems that we're working in. So what's missing from the report that I see, I haven't found it, is institutional capacity strengthening and system capacity strengthening. So I'm interested in how you think about that. Thank, no, you. thank you for your comment. Just wants to give a quick yeah. reply to that. Uh, that's a point well taken. That, uh, thank you very much. I, I, I do think that we could emphasize more the, the institutional and the governance aspects as well. 
typically, you know, when, when these reports are done, we tend to focus on the technical solutions and we tend to forget who's going to do them. So we end up with a bunch of recommendations that are anonymous, uh, with no actors, with no, with no idea of who's going to do what and with no agreements on how to, how to proceed. And I think that that's one of the key things that we need to, uh, we, we need to weave into the report and into all the recommendations as in, in the next stages. But also, you know, in the implementation, I think that we are, we are really, uh, we, we always assume roles and <laughs> of, of partners that are somewhere out there that we are imagining that they're going to help us do this. And in reality, they're never brought to the conversation. So uh, I really think that we need to work uh, and really, you know, put our hand in our heart and address that uh, solidly. Thank you. So we have time for one last question. And so, well, it, I saw that gentleman's hands up first, but you can actually submit your questions for later. So we'll close with your question. Yeah, thank you. I'm uh, John Maidendorp, Legum Systems Research Innovation Lab, Michigan State University. Honored to be here. Thank you for the report. Great work. Uh, one of the things that I also found absent from the report, in addition to capacity development, is uh, the lack of mention of urbanization. Um, I think that's probably one of the biggest crises we're going to face in the next decades. I'm wondering if we couldn't at least uh, make mention of it and start preparing for the future to address those issues because uh, they generate a lot of the crises that uh, we're going to face, we're currently facing and are going to face in the future because our, our infrastructure is not, uh, not sufficient to sustain those populations. So just a recommendation that that be taken into consideration in the future. Thank you. Thank you. And so um, at this time, I think I call, you're coming back up, Lawrence, is that correct? So at this time, I want to thank the, the audience. Um, let's give the panel one last round of applause. I want to thank you, Mario, for the excellent moderation. And uh, at this stage, I'll turn it over to you, Lawrence. Thank you. I want to thank Andrew, uh, Mario, and all of our expert panelists and speakers, and our experts and members of the audience for your participation in such a, a lively conversation this morning. Uh, can we give them another round of applause? That is <laughs> Before closing our morning program, we'll now turn to Dr. Lini Wallingberg, co-chair of the BIFAD subcommittee on S systemic Solutions for Climate Change Adaptation and Mitigation in Agriculture, Nutrition, and Food Systems. Dr. Wallenberg is a research professor at the Gund Institute at the University of Vermont and associate scientist with the Alliance of Bioversity International and SEAT. She will share her takeaways from this morning's conversation that we should keep in mind going into this afternoon's presentation of a new report that has been guided by the subcommittee. Let's welcome Lini at this time. Thank you, Lawrence, and thank you, everyone, for a really interesting morning. I have the unenviable task of a spontaneous synthesis of what we've been discussing. So our goal, our charge, was to have a unified vision for all of these various objectives, with climate change being the newest kid on the block and the real focus of our, of our entire day. And Gillian challenged us to identify what the most important question was. So I'd like to propose that we don't have an important question, and that's exactly the problem. We don't want to say that the most important question is to achieve it all, because we can't. We can't even say that the most important question is to achieve, uh, to understand trade-offs, even though that's important because uh, it's more than just trade-offs. I think the question is how to balance our objectives and how to not only balance them, but how to balance them in this place, in this time, with these people. And that's ultimately an enormously complex task. And, and we've failed because the con context specificity of that is challenging and because of multiple interests that continually compete with each other. 
It means Rob, wherever Rob is, that there's no one North Star anymore. They're not even two North Stars. They're probably three North Stars, at least, that any one program is going to have to prioritize in the context of other things that they're trying to achieve. Maybe there are even 10 North Stars. And it also means that we're going to need congressional mandates and congressional indicators that address these multiple indicators, um, our multiple um, objectives. So drawing on some of the themes from this morning, I'd like to highlight just a few. First, we need to move from technology and productivity to the systems thinking, to behavior change, to thinking more about incentives, and thinking more about consumers and food systems. That's really clear. I don't think anybody would argue with any of that. We have to stop thinking about the themes that our, our um, panel presented here of land use, water, nutrition, and policy being the stepchildren, and rather thinking of them as part, part of the family. And we need to consider this notion of moonshots and transformation as something that everybody has a charge to do. That we can't just be comfortable in our business as usual type of thinking, but we really have to reach beyond our comfort zone. So the report's current recommendations are uh, four or five, depending on how you count them. First is to consider these long-term uh, climate compatible, uh, or I should say long, consider how agriculture begin can be more compatible with long-term climate change. So to have more research on what the long-term climate change would be. Second is to maximize, and that's interesting language that we should think carefully about the co-benefits or maximize basically the benefits of all of these other things that we care about in agriculture and food systems. Third is to have the social and behavioral change that we need to accomplish all of it. And finally, the partnerships that we need, including the local and South-South partnerships. And the fifth uh, recommendation that's buried a little bit further in the report is that we need to consider locally driven research as a mechanism for adaptation. So thinking about what's missing from that list and what I can draw from the discussion today and what the authors and the subcommittee will consider quite seriously is first, how can research itself be a systems change? So how can we use research to support um, this uh, transformational change that we need um, and achieve targets. And so I think research itself has to be driven by targets um, in ad for adaptation and mitigation, and it has to be um, considered uh, and ultimately the systems change. Second is, how can we better specify um, the incentives and institutional change that we need? You know, the social science research is uh, always secondary to the technical research. I, I work mostly in the CGIR, and it's always the second citizen. And so we need to think about better ways to elevate that research so that it has concrete outcomes and, and is, is uh, rewarded. And then lastly is this question of governance of trade-offs, or what I would prefer to call balance. How do we govern, how do we support research to improve the governance of, of the balance of the objectives that we're trying to achieve. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lini. I'm really looking forward to this afternoon's program to, for learning more about the new report uh, recommendations, including uh, those pertaining to research. Uh, this, morning con this morning's conversation has given us um, a lot more dots to connect. Um, for our audience in the room, uh, please take time over the lunch break to review the summary handout of report targets and recommendations. It's now available at the back of the room. Uh, for our online audience, please take a look at the executive summary of the report that is posted on the BIFAD website. We will reconvene here at 1.30 to discuss the subcommittee's new draft report on operationalizing USAID climate strategy and agri-food systems programming. I look forward to seeing you all then. <laughs>